Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 State of the University Address. My name is Kimberly Mars, and I'm the president of the Student Government Association on the Pleasantville campus. I would like to thank President Krizlov for giving me the opportunity to be here and to thank you all for joining us, whether you're in person or viewing via our live stream. 2021 was a year of learning for us all, but the PACE community is no stranger to being able to persevere no matter how uncertain the times may be. As a student leader on campus, I was able to witness firsthand how much students were yearning for some sense of normalcy in their college experience. And even though there were a few bumps in the road, I believe that we are successfully getting to that point. Since the return of in-person classes and events, I'm always so excited to see how much life has been brought back to our campus. As a student, there is nothing I love more than being able to interact with my peers while also having peace of mind that I'm staying safe due to the COVID protocols that have been put into place by the university. Even though things may not be 100% normal right now, I honestly believe that together we can make the best out of any situation. In today's State of the University Address, President Krizlov will provide us with plans for PACE's budding future and how we will further navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. After President Krizlov's message, there will be a live Q&A session. For those of you who are watching the live stream and are wondering how you can participate, you should pose your questions in the provided chat box. Our amazing Chief Diversity Officer, Tiffany Hamilton, is the moderator for our conversation today and will monitor the chat and then pose your questions to President Krizlov after his remarks. With that being said, I am honored to introduce Pace University's President, Marvin Krizlov. Colleagues, students, friends, from the Kessel Student Center on our Pleasantville campus, good afternoon. And thank you, Kim, for that warm introduction. Before we begin today, I want to pause to remember Jordan Robinson, who passed away 10 days ago. I was not lucky enough to know Jordan, but everything I have heard about him makes me sad that I did not. He was a remarkable young man, kind, caring, giving, and optimistic. He made life better for people around him, and he had big plans to change the world. Our community is devastated by this loss, and as I've told his parents and his friends, we send them all his, our support. Please join me in a brief moment of silence to honor Jordan's memory. Thank you. Now I want to move to a broad look at our PACE community and where things stand on our campuses. To do that, I want to start by reporting three numbers. First, 2.2%. That is the current COVID positivity rate in Westchester County, down from about 23% on January 1st. Second number, 1.3%. That is the current positivity rate in New York City, also down from about 23% on January 1st. And finally, zero. That is the total number of PACE students currently in quarantine or isolation on any of our campuses. With that in mind, I am very pleased to say that the state of our university and the state of our community is very strong. I know it's risky to proclaim that we are through the worst, but based on what we are seeing and reading, based on Governor Hochul's decision to relax mandates in New York, based on updates from our COVID task force, I am very, very optimistic. When I spoke to you on this occasion a year ago, we were also just past a winter spike. We were proud of what we had accomplished and we were hopeful for a better future. But in February of 2021, the vaccine rollout had just begun. Younger adults, including college students, would not become eligible until April. We were still to face Delta and we were still to face Omicron. I was optimistic last February. We were all optimistic and yet the year did not go quite as any of us had hoped. Today, things are different. We have been vaccinated and we are getting boosted. We have been through these surges. We now know that COVID will continue to be part of our lives 
perhaps indefinitely, but we also now know how to manage it. We have at home tests. Soon we will have vaccine eligibility for even our small children. We have powerful therapeutics for those who get sick. A year ago, we had none of that. The World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, government leaders, health leaders are all saying the same thing. COVID-19 is well on its way to becoming endemic, not pandemic. It will be something that remains with us, but it will not overwhelm us. The flu is endemic. The common cold is endemic. And now it is time for Pace University to treat COVID-19 as endemic. That doesn't mean we'll let down our guard. We will be careful and cautious. We will follow federal, state, and local health guidelines. But within those boundaries, we will do everything we can to return to a more traditional campus experience. With Omicron in retreat, it is now time for us to move ahead to the new normal. Two weeks ago, we moved the COVID alert level on our three campuses back to yellow. That was the first step. Now our goal is to get to green as soon as we possibly can. Green will mean regular occupancy levels, regular guest and visitor policies, and regular activities. Masks will become optional in most places. We will still require them in classrooms and on elevators for those who are exempt from the vaccine requirement and in certain other situations. Anyone who chooses to wear a mask will always be welcome. Other things will change too. And if current trends stay on track, I hope we'll be able to make that move to green with full details as soon as next week. That makes today an ideal time for us to look ahead to a new and improved future for Pace University. We will return, we have returned to those parts of the old normal that are central to what we do. In-person classes, building community and supporting one another, teaching and learning, research and internships, seeing one another in hallways and chatting in dining halls. But at the same time, we will take the lessons of the last two years and we will build them into everything we do. We will be more flexible and more adaptable. We will make more use of technology. We will teach and learn remotely for those who need it. We will work remotely when it makes sense because in the last two years, we've become experts on all these things too. Before I, want to, before I talk more about the future, I want to take a minute to acknowledge the past. Perhaps the most profound lesson of the past two years was seeing just how strong this community is. We say that people of Pace University are go-getters, and through 23, 23 long months of the pandemic, all of us, all of you, continued to do what we needed to do. Our university operated, our faculty taught, our students learned. We worked together and we kept our community safe. We continued to create opportunities. We made a commitment to be an anti-racist, inclusive community. And we worked and we continue to work to build DEI priorities into everything we do. Because of what we accomplished together, students chose to be here, to be at pace. Now, I don't wanna overstate, the pandemic did affect enrollment for a variety of reasons, finances, health, family, student experience. Some students opted not to enroll in college. Some students paused their education and now we're doing everything we can to bring them back. Last year, the 2021 academic year, Pace did see an enrollment decline as colleges and universities did nationwide. For this year, that national trend continued, but at Pace this year, things are different. This fall, we enrolled our largest class of incoming first year students of the 21st century, as far back as we have good records. We currently enroll more graduate students than we've had this century. And at the law school, our enrollment is the highest it has been in at least 10 years. Overall, our enrollment is up about 5% from last year and just about even where, with where it was pre-pandemic. Again, against a backdrop of significant enrollment decreases nationwide. And our application numbers for next year 
are trending even better. Students are choosing to be here, choosing to be at pace. Those strong enrollment numbers combined with aggressive expense management and yes, federal aid in the past year left us in the strongest budget position we have been for some time. We ended the 2021, 2021, 2020, 2020, 2021 fiscal year with a small surplus. This year, we are once again forecasting a surplus with no special aid, and we are likely to report our best operating result in years. This is thanks to all our budget discipline and the work and commitment of so many. This is very good news. We have eliminated or nearly eliminated operating deficits in Pleasantville and at the Haub Law School and across all of our schools and colleges. This is also very good news. And it is due to the hard work and the strategic resourceful thinking of a great number of people, Provost Vanya Quinones, who led that effort together with the finance team, the deans, their faculties, and the many staff members who have taken on more responsibilities. Thank you all for your efforts to help us achieve these goals. I wanna pause for a moment to talk about the word surplus. In many ways, it's a misnomer. A surplus suggests we might have extra money or money to spare. As we know, that really isn't the case. The strategic plan we've worked together to develop over these last few years calls for a target surplus of 4%. We are not quite there yet, but surpluses are important because they enable us to invest. They do not mean we can be wasteful, but they do mean we can breathe easier. That means that we can invest in people and programs that will build our future. When I look back at this past year, I realized that even as we faced profound struggles, we also saw remarkable success. We kept our trend lines moving in the right direction, and we continued to accomplish so many of these individual triumphs that together make up this inspiring community. Our students continued to show all the ways in which their hardworking, ambitious, world-conquering go-getters. In the last academic year, one student won a Fulbright, nine were named Millennium Fellows, two won the Jeanette Watson Fellowship, and our inaugural Schwartzman Scholar completed her master's in global affairs at Tsinghua University in Beijing. For the fifth time in eight years, our Federal Reserve Challenge Team won the national championship this fall, meaning that Pace has now supplanted Harvard as the winningest school in the history of that competition. Our pace setter student athletes have continued to compete despite the many obstacles facing them. Right now, our women's and men's basketball team both boast excellent records with hopes to snag spots in the NCAA Final Four. And last month, our women's basketball coach, Coach Carrie Seymour recorded her 500th win, a tremendous milestone. This semester, we launched eSports as our 15th varsity team. It's an interdisciplinary effort that creates a new kind of student athlete. This bi-campus team is competing virtually for now, honing skills like teamwork, strategy, and discipline. And we will build a brand new eSports center in 15 Beekman on the New York City campus. Across our campuses, our clubs and, and activities have continued to meet remarkably with more than 1500 different events held last semester in virtual, in person and hybrid formats. Our performing arts students continue to perform and we have brought in exciting new PPA leadership. Our legal clinics continue to serve our community and all of our students continued to excel. In fact, we had some especially good news from our class of 2021. In recent years, we have been focused on raising our retention and graduation rates. Improving those numbers is the single most important thing we can do to make PACE stronger. Retaining and graduating more students helps our finances, helps our ranking, and most importantly, most importantly, ensures that we deliver the promise of opportunitas to as many students as possible. With last May's graduates, our six-year graduation rate reached 59%, the fourth consecutive year of increase, 
and the highest that rate has been in at least 20 years. And this year's number is poised to be even better. That too is a big success. I wanna be clear, students are the ones who achieve these successes, but they get there thanks to the work of our dedicated faculty and staff. We do know that faculty are the heart and soul of PACE. And even as they have supported students through this challenging time, they've also maintained their research, continuing their scholarly output, and kept on winning grants. To name just a few highlights, for the first time ever, PACE won the New York State Economic Development Council grants to help expand and revitalize state-of-the-art training labs, one for the College of Health Professions in New York and the other for the Dyson College in Westchester. At Haub Law, it seems clear that the New York State budget this year will include $225,000 earmarked to support our food and beverage law clinic. Dyson and School of Education faculty won big grants from the New York State Department of Education. Seidenberg faculty won big grants from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Indeed, last year, Seidenberg Zhang Zhang became the first PACE professor to win grants from both the NSF and the NIH. And Dyson professor Michelle Chase won a prestigious fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities for her research on 20th century Cuba. Our successes throughout the pandemic extend to other realms too. For example, fundraising. Despite the suspension of nearly all in-person alumni and philanthropic events, in 2021, we raised more than 17.5 million. It was our single best year ever, except for 2016, when we received the transformational Haub gift to the law school. And this year, this year looks to be on track to be even better. Our donors and friends are choosing to be part of PACE because they believe in what we're doing. In fact, we are so inspired by the generosity of our alumni and friends that we will soon be asking the Board of Trustees to expand the campaign for PACE and extend our fundraising grant to 300 million over the coming years. Our donors and friends choose to support us because they, are, they know that what we are doing works. Look at the outcomes. Our remarkable Career Services Office reports that our 2021 graduates are setting new records for success for the percentage of graduates employed in service or continuing their education. They are still crunching the numbers, but we are trending toward a positive outcome rate well over 90%, which would be the highest rate in years. At the Lubin School, where the analysis is complete, the success rate for bachelor's graduates is 94%, and for master's graduates, it is an extraordinary 98%. So employers are also choosing to be part of Pace University. So what comes next? That is simple in a way. We're gonna lean into everything we've learned during the past two years, and we're gonna use it to build an even better, stronger university. During the pandemic and working together, we've developed our new strategic plan, Pace Forward, and we are now working to implement it. We will reinforce our position as the leader in our region for experiential education, fully building out the Pace Path across all of our undergraduate programs. Our new goal is to ensure that every undergraduate completes at least two experiential activities, things like internships, clinicals, academic research, and so forth during their time with us. These important experiences make Pace University unique, and we know they lead to academic and career success for our students. We will meet the needs of the marketplace, offering new, innovative, and interdisciplinary programs, providing the education students want and teaching the skills employers seek. Our faculty is hard at work developing these new programs. We will also continue to meet the needs of today's students, offering accelerated degrees, non-degree credentials, and more hybrid and remote programs. We have known for some time that it is near where we need to be and how today's students, and especially the graduate students of today, want to learn. 
The pandemic showed us how well we can do it. Now are we are using this expertise and the resources of our new online learning center to continue the expansion led by Sean O'Reilly and his terrific team in professional education and special programs. We will continue to increase our retention and graduation rates. We have set a five-year goal of reaching a 70% six-year graduation rate. We are trending in the right direction, but getting there will take work, hard work from all of us. I am confident we can do this. The provost office is starting a major initiative on belonging, which the research shows is crucial to student success. Five working groups, mental health and well-being, active engagement and learning, co-curricular engagement, student experience and support services are currently being assembled and will report back with recommendations by the end of the semester. We have renewed our commitment to mental health and well-being across our communities, which we know has become even more important through this pandemic. Our chief wellness officer, former Dean Harriet Feldman, is hard at work developing these plans and resources. We also will do more to ensure our students stay engaged in their studies and graduate on time. We have revamped advising, creating the learning commons and rethought tutoring and supports for writing, math, and now science. We are building major maps for every undergrad major, and this semester we will launch the Graduate on Time initiative. We will deliver our students a better customer experience, streamlining and digitizing our processes. A group of university leaders assisted by outside experts is working to better leverage our technology, utilize design thinking, and simplify the student administrative process to increase satisfaction and help re improve retention. We have reaffirmed our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Last year, I announced a major donation that established the Barry M. and Jackie Gossin Center for Equity and Inclusion. This year, I'm pleased to say that we will soon announce the center's leadership. The work has already begun. We know we must create and maintain inclusive learning spaces and workplaces. We are providing the tools and resources to help everyone thrive, and we are building relationships with the many diverse communities in which we recruit and hire. We must become an even better place to work with more transparent internal communication and more resources. This spring, we will be conducting the Great Colleges to Work For survey, which is a chance for us to hear what we're doing well and where we need to improve. We will be surveying all full-time employees, faculty and staff, plus adjunct faculty, and we will be acting on the results. We are committed to repeating this survey at a regular cadence. We know that some areas have been hit hard by the great resignation, and we're working to address that. Ensuring that Pace University is an employer of choice will help us attract and retain the best talent. We are also moving ahead with the real estate plans that will set us up for future success. In New York City, One Pace Plaza renovation west has been finished, giving us a beautiful new home for the Lubin School of Business. We've completely taken over 161 William Street. The lobby just opened, the new lobby, and it looks really great. And we are well underway on 15 Beekman. That building will provide a dedicated home for the Seidenberg School, a new and modern residence hall, and new community and learning spaces, including a state-of-the-art library and a new dining commons. Our plans for the east side of One Pace Plaza continue to develop. As you may know, our original plan was to sell the development rights and use the proceeds to increase our endowment and fund strategic investments. But the pandemic happened and the real estate market changed profoundly. We may still find a development partner for One Pace Plaza, but we are also exploring other options, including retaining the building and renovating it to meet the needs of our programs. That would allow us to further consolidate our lease spaces and also preserve the development rights as an asset. We are confident that we will reach a good solution and we look forward to sharing updates as we are able. 
In Pleasantville and White Plains, we are moving forward with important deferred maintenance projects, and we are also working to consolidate our footprint wherever possible. For example, by selling the underutilized Crane Avenue houses at the Haublau campus, which will help us invest in more productive areas. And finally, if there's another variant, another surge, we will manage it. The provost's office and the task force are establishing a COVID response grid. Flare-ups will not be crises. We will have a process in place. If positivity rates hit certain milestones, we will know what we need to do and we will do it. We do have big plans for the future. We've achieved these great successes despite tremendous adversity. I know it's hard work. The past two years have required commitment, dedication, and resilience. It has been challenging, exhausting, and emotionally taxing. So let me say to everybody, everybody who's watching and listening, to all of our students and faculty and staff, thank you. Thank you for your commitment to our community. Thank you for your commitment to the power of education. Thank you for continuing to advance our crucial mission of opportunitas. To the students who kept up in your studies, who adapted when we had to pivot, who accepted necessary limits on your activities, who stuck to it and stayed on track, thank you. To the faculty members who become expert at online education, who continued to support, to counsel, to mentor, who dealt with their own personal challenges, but continued to deliver for our students, thank you. To our faculty councils, and especially to our faculty council leadership, who have shouldered new responsibilities and adapted to new realities as we work together, thank you. To the deans and the vice presidents who've managed through unpredictability, have overseen pivots and changes, who never lost sight of our mission and our goals, thank you. To the board of trustees, to our dedicated alumni and friends, thank you for continuing to believe. To our tireless administrative staff, especially those in student-facing or otherwise in-person roles who didn't have the option of working from home each time we faced another spike, thank you. I know that everything we've done this year would not have happened without the work of our support staff. You have our deepest gratitude. And finally, on behalf of everyone at PACE, I wanna give a special thank you. Devanya Quinones, our provost, Brian Anderson, our director of emergency management and environmental health and safety, to Cindy Heilberger, my chief of staff, and everyone, everyone who served on the COVID task force, who on top of their regular jobs spent the last two years meeting sometimes every week and sometimes every day to review the changing data and guidelines to discuss the situation and determine the right path forward. We have been so successful over these past two years because of the extraordinary leadership and sensitivity shown by you, by Vanya, by Brian, by Cindy, and every member of the COVID task force. We are all in your debt. At the same time, I'm also really happy to report that this morning, after 105 weeks, the COVID task force held its final regularly scheduled meeting. They will spring back into action if and when we need them. But I can think of no clearer sign that PACE is ready to move forward. This summer, I was honored to be reappointed by the Board of Trustees to another five-year term as the president of Pace University. I'm very grateful to the trustees for the opportunity and to the faculty, staff, and students who served on the Presidential Evaluation Committee and to the entire Pace community. As I reflect on that process and on the many meetings and conversations I've had with so many of you over my first five years, I realize how lucky I am to work with such an engaged, committed group of professionals. I've learned so much from all of you about PACE, about our importance, about our role in the world, and about how to be a stronger leader. But most of all, the reappointment process and everything we've been through together serves to renew my commitment 
to this university, to our students, and to our powerful mission. Throughout the pandemic, some have questioned the value of college. At Pace, over the past two years, as is part of our history, we proved it. We kept our enrollment up, we increased our graduation rates, and we delivered remarkable, life-changing employment outcomes for our students. Our students are the ones who continue to inspire me. Committing to a college education through these past two years has been an act of courage. I am humbled impressed and impressed by the students who've continued to learn, have continued to study, have continued to do the work necessary to seize those opportunities. Everything we do here, it is for our students. The outpouring of love for Jordan Robinson and the support for his family and friends has demonstrated just how extraordinary our students are and how extraordinary they can be. Jordan was one of those. He believed in doing something nice for someone each and every day. If we all do that, follow his example, we will have a powerful multiplier effect that will increase kindness and strengthen our community, and it will be a fitting tribute to his legacy. In a few short months, we will hold our first in-person commencement in three years. It will be big, exciting, fun, in a big, exciting, prominent new venue. We will celebrate graduates from three class years, and we know that each one of those graduates has his or her or their story of success, that they all confronted speed bumps, that they all overcame obstacles, that they all persevered. We create these opportunities. We make that difference. That is what PACE has always done, and it's what PACE will always do. Even as we talk about change, new programs, new expertise, new ways of working, it is all in the service of our historic mission. And as we know, as war clouds loom in Europe, we are reminded of the importance of education. We are reminded of the importance of understanding across countries and cultures. As New York rebuilds and reopens, we look to our students and to the next generation to help build a better world. And at a moment of societal transformation, we know, we know that we can count on PACE students and PACE graduates to be the leaders of tomorrow. That is why this university matters. We have come through this pandemic stronger than ever. We are ready to move pace forward. We will do this together. Thank you. And now, we're moving to our question and answer period. Good afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me okay, President Krizlov, and those in attendance, great. Thank you so much for providing the, the university updates and all of that rich information. We've got a couple of questions in the chat that I wanna bring to your attention. Uh, you mentioned the upcoming Great Places to Work survey. And so this question is really regarding salary equity among faculty, particularly those who are contingent. So the first part is, will adjuncts be able to participate in the survey? And then the second part is, how can we improve the experiences of this group who may not be thriving uh, as desired? Thank you, Tiffany. Um, should I be wearing this? No, okay. Um, the adjunct faculty will be eligible to participate in the survey. And I think that we look forward to their comments, but we don't have to wait for the survey. Um, we are very happy, the, the folks in, in human resources and the provost's office are always happy to have discussions about how we can improve the experience of, of all our faculty um, and including our contingent or adjunct faculty. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, another question that came in is you talked about improving rankings for the university. How exactly will we do that? So the most important thing to do is to improve retention and graduation rates. Um, and that's really the single most important thing that we are focused on. Um, the good news is that with last May's graduates, our six-year graduation rate reached 
59%, which is highest at least since 1994. This year's um, graduate, this year's six year graduate rate will be even hot, better because last year's five year rate was 59.8. So the six year graduate rate will be only higher. The goal is to be higher than 70%, reach 70% in five years. There's, there's a group of faculty and, and administrators who are talking about rankings and there's other areas that we can work on, but the single most important thing is the graduate and retention level. Thank you, very, very helpful. I wanna switch gears a little bit because you, you talked about the well-being of our students and the work that we're doing around mental health. And so the next question really is focusing on, is there an update on specific resources or changes that are occurring to support the mental health of our students? Um, additionally, how are we making sure that the counseling center and other partners uh, are supported and not being overwhelmed by these changes? So I know the Counseling Center has really stepped up during this period. And our counseling services still offer walk-in, call-in hours Monday through Friday. There's no wait list to see a counselor. Um, and there's more information at pace.edu slash counseling. But I know that we are also looking at other types of resources, including um, telehealth and, and so forth. So, um, and of course, the the chief wellness officer is also looking at things like groups and, and the counseling centers also look at groups. So I don't have all the details in front of me, but um, I would encourage people to reach out to the counseling center to see if they have questions about what resources are available. Um, very helpful and that we might want to take a note and offer that as a future community conversation so that we can collectively update folks of what's going on around our efforts to support mental health well-being for our students and employees as well. Uh, you, you, you spoke a lot about the great work that the COVID task force has done and that we have the zero students in quarantine and making progress in those areas. Now that we are at level yellow and the COVID task force is kind of settling or had their first last official meeting, do we have an update for allowing community members back on campus? So I think that the, the, the group is looking at um, raising the level to green, that may happen next week if the numbers work out. Um, and there are opportunities for community members to come on campus right now under certain conditions. And uh, you know that may continue, that will, hoping things move in the right direction, there will be even more opportunities for community members. Community members are allowed to come on campus under, under certain circumstances right now. It's very helpful. You know, you spoke a lot about what the community has been able to uh, survive, if you will, over the last 23 months. And I know you had your recent article around uh, how compact how important compassion is right now in the work that we're doing. So this question is really focusing on the, the faculty and staff that have supported uh, university students and even each other, sometimes at the cost of their own health and well-being. Any thoughts or insight on what we can do institutionally to support our employees that may still feel a little stuck coming out of the 23 months or just not uh, fully recharged themselves around their health and well-being? Well, I know that that's a high priority for all of us. And I'd say that uh, coming to campus and seeing the students for me is the single best way that I can get excited about being here. I understand that different people have different needs and we're happy to work with people. Um, Human Resources has a wide range of, of resources and activities that, that can help. And if there are certain things that we're not doing, please, Susan Donnie, who's sitting right in front of me, she's the Interim Director of Human Resources, and I know she'd be happy to hear um, specific ideas people have. And I also think that we don't have to do it necessarily university-wide. Sometimes things are done in, in, in smaller groups. And so if, if, if um, you know, people want to do it within colleges or, or clubs or activities, that's, we're, we're happy to try to support that as well. That's very good. And, and, you know, I think what I'm also hearing is that we can kind of take the limits off of how we approach supporting our faculty and staff, those that report to us, creating those spaces maybe within our departments or units 
to support the well-being. I would like to take a moment to not necessarily ask a question, but bring voice to uh, what our chief wellness officer placed in the chat just around health and well-being so the full folk community can hear that they've we've offered students uh, webinars on resilience. The recording is available, so we'll be sure to circulate that. And some faculty programming has taken place as well. So it sounds like there's opportunities to partner with our chief wellness officer to bring in some of those resources to our faculty and staff. And we are also in the process of developing a strategic plan for wellness based on the eight attributes of wellness. So more information will be um, available to community for that moving forward. And our chief wellness officer also wanted to add that Aetna has some great resources that mm -hmm. can help build out the framework uh, for supporting as well. You know, we're coming to uh, an end of our Q&A period. Uh, there was a question around the certain circumstances allowing community members to return, but I think that might be a great opportunity to point folks to the COVID task force website, what those circumstances may be. But if you wanted to ex expand a little bit more on uh, community members returning to campus, I offer you the opportunity to do that. You know, I think it's probably best that we look at the, the COVID task force guidelines. Um, I, I know that that we are trying to make our campus both safe and and welcoming, and and that's the those are the guidelines that we've been trying to promulgate. Got it, got it. Well, you know, I'll end with our our last question here. You are in the center of student exchange on the Pleasantville campus, uh, our our Kessel Student Center. And what words of advice, if you will, would you share for our students? and community that continue to navigate higher education in these uh, non-traditional circumstances. What, what you know, words of advice or motivation would you give us to get us across this finish line this spring semester? We've done so much. We've done so well. Having a strong education is the single best predictor of success in life. And we are here for you. And we're going to drag you across the finish line if it takes that. But let's let's hope that you can do it without that. But we will help you if you need it. And let us know if you need that help. And we're so proud of you. And we can't wait to see you at commencement. Awesome. Thank you so much, President Chris Law, for taking the time to answer the questions in the chat. And we hope that you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.